What's up, what's up, what's up, everybody? You're listening to the Data is My Science podcast, the show that makes data your passion. I am your host, Dapper Data. I have a very, very special guest on this line right now, okay? You see him right here if you're on the video. If you're not, then you are out of luck, okay? Because this person right here, I'm telling you right now, has has been an intricate part of, I want to say, the data science community, you know, coming from a certain background that has nothing to do with data science, but you know, I guess we can, we can, we can, we can say it could have something to do with data science, right? The financial industry. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then he he's de- he decided at some point in his career to make a transition and focus on the data science industry. All right. Now this person right here, we're going to talk about the journey of being a data scientist. We're going to talk about the journey to data, right? There's a journey there. And everybody has their own, their own path. You know, me, y'all, you all have heard my path, my journey to data science, right? You've heard many other people talk about their journey, right? The journey is going to be a little bit different, right? And then we're also going to talk about the head of data, right? You have your chief data officer, you got your data scientists, you have your data analysts, you have uh, data engineers, right? You have all these different data, 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 data positions, but being the head of data, head of data scientists, it has its own daily tasks that you have to come about. And depending on the company it is, I think that it's important that we highlight small, medium, large businesses. There's probably different aspects as to what that means to be the head of data. And then we're going to talk about something that I am very excited about, diversity and inclusion within data. Okay, that right there is an important topic. Okay, so definitely tune in to this podcast. This is very exciting. All right. So without further ado, I want to introduce you all to David Sepulveda. You know, David is, man, he's an amazing person and he is an ex-financial analyst originally from Mexico who made the move to tech and data science, right? So imagine that transition. All right. You're thinking finance, but analysts right there probably just sets it off, right? To be able to go over into data science. But you think finance, you think what you know, you're thinking money, you're thinking accounting, you're thinking all the different things, right? But then you're you're not really thinking data science, and we're going to talk about how that is an important role within the data within the data science industry. You think finance, healthcare, whatever it is, that is an important role. So, from a publicly traded company, right, to Series A, that's the transition that David has gone through. You know, he's passionate about the impact of data and developing others. And so without further ado, I want to introduce you all to David. Say what's up, David. <laughs> How's it going, folks? Thank you for joining in, man. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. And thank you for having me. Um, yeah, as you, uh, as you mentioned, I grew up in Mexico and I studied what was known back then as management information systems, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what happened is that right before graduation, I was you know, getting very curious about finance. We keep hearing all these headlines. You heard about the boom and bust and large companies succeeding or not. And I said, okay, I really want to learn what makes a business a successful business, right? What takes a business to make it to headlines? And of course, you know, we learn a lot along the way. Um, but after that, I basically became a financial analyst, FPNA, mm-hmm. Financial Planning and Analysis, the acronym, um, the jargon. And I basically spent the next uh, nine years, you know, analyzing financial statements and eventually evaluating investment opportunities at a VC investment firm, right? Mm. Uh, you can say I was on the other side, so to speak. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but what happened is that eventually I realized that I missed tech, right? My degree is a mm-hmm. fairly technical um, degree. And I said, oh, hey, what should I do to make mm-hmm. the jump? So I moved from, um, I was in Texas at the time. I moved to San Francisco. I didn't know anyone, no job, no place to live. Mm. And I said, okay, let's do this. And what basically happened is that ever since I now get to work with much more fun data, right? Uh, Much more interesting data sets, different shapes, different sizes. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm super excited to have you on. And your story is amazing, you know, because that transition, a lot of people think that they're, they're always saying, man, you know, I... I'm in this space that has nothing to do with data science. I hear this buzzword data science all the time, right? You know, I hear data analysts all the time now, right? Within the past few years, that's like the the golden thing right there. And if you're, 
if you're not in the data industry or you're not making data driven decisions, right? You know, if you're if you're not even hip to it, right? You you feel like you are going to be out of the loop soon, very soon. And so a lot of people say, man, if I'm already in, say, the hospitality industry or I'm in, uh, you know, management of something else, right? Not just hotels, whatever it is, you know, I'm in management. They don't think they can make that transition over to something like data science. You know, I think the journey is maybe longer because you have to have, you know, more of a transition, you know, to it. And you you've been a financial analyst. Right. How easy was it for you to make that transition? You know, yeah, it's a it's a great point. And I, I hope folks keep their minds open as they embark on these journeys. Um, what kick, what keeps you closer, I guess, to that goal is never forgetting that at the end of the day, another beginning, truly, what matters is achieving impact, right, with mm-hmm. data. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, there are different layers of our famous stack. Um, but what everybody hires, anyone whose job title starts with data is do something <laughs> valuable with it. Yeah. Engineer it, analyze it, or make it scientific. Um, mm-hmm. And again, impact can take many shapes and forms, right? There's obviously revenue uh, growth, but there's also cost savings. There's also productivity, efficiency, and you name it, right? Mm-hmm. Like I, uh, at some point in my career, I was in an HR department. The company mm-hmm. was so large that I was in the team that was the closest to HR information systems. So mm-hmm. the data that we work with was even in, uh, related to performance management talent, mm-hmm. staffing, right? That's not revenue, that's not cost, but it's mm-hmm. about, for example, helping folks be in the right job for them. Yeah. And, and I never forgotten that, right? So I think that, um, you know, happy to talk uh, in a while about it, but our world is, is so fast changing and full with terminology that we can easily get lost in the terms, mm-hmm. right? Um, I love a quote from a former colleague of mine who said, I'm a data scientist because it's very easy. I love data but I believe in the scientific method. So mm-hmm. I don't need to be running a model or building a new model every week. Yeah. It can be a very simple analysis, but I want the scientific method to be what guides me every day. And it's yeah. just st- stayed with me since. No, no, that, that you're right. You're absolutely right. Right. I remember doing a post on Instagram one day and, uh, it, and we talked about, I basically did a post that said, who's a data scientist, right? And it was like, about 50 to 100 people that raised their hand, right? And one person was like, I'm a statistician, you know? So they, they still say they're a data scientist. One person said they're a machine learning expert. One person said, hey, I own a restaurant. I'm a data scientist, right? One person said, hey, I'm just an assistant, executive assistant, I'm a data scientist. And and so I told my, my, my thought process with uh, displaying that message was that anybody could, be a data, they could call themselves a data scientist if they're making those data driven decisions and they're actually making sure that they're coming out with an outcome using the data, right? Because the data can be used exactly. to kind of support your decision, right? Or make the decision for you. You know, you can actually look at it and say, look, I mean, if I'm sitting there uh, trying to pick out what furniture that I want for my patio, Right or for my deck, <laughs> and and I and I decide to use customer driven data decision making. Right and now, now I'm sitting here, I'm googling, you know, how <laughs> what what patio furniture I need and stuff. But but my buddy might have said, hey, you need to do this. I'm like, okay, great. I'm going to go ahead and go and Google. Right, you know, I go on Google and I'm searching things like that, and I have about 50 different options up, and I'm making decisions. I'm 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 breaking it down and stuff like that. It takes that time. And then I decide to use maybe like some type of oak furniture or something like that for my for my uh, that's my final decision. Right. And that's because I, I've, I've used the data. Right? I've collected the data. Right. But I'm just Absolutely. I'm not sitting there like doing it with machines. I'm actually just Googling and I'm using my brain to say and, and decipher which one I like. Right. Based off of my own opinion. And don't no. forget the qualitative input from our significant others, right? That right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's very true. I cannot forget that, right? <laughs> yeah. So you are a part of a company called Kumo Space, right? And and it's interesting right. because you know Kumo Space, and I'll I'll highlight this right now for anybody that want to go there and check it out, right? KumoSpace.com. Kumo Space is very very interesting to me, right? Can you tell them a little bit about what Kumo Space is about? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the last two years have um, 
allowed a lot of folks to find businesses, grow their businesses in some mm -hmm. directions and just feel the impact of whatever happened. Um, Kumo Space is now, what I would say, the best provider of uh, virtual office platforms. Right? <laughs> um, bias, bias. Just, just a little bit. <laughs> but, uh, you know, what we do, Bobby, is we realize that the, the way we work changed, right? The way we work and the way many folks and teams and sometimes entire company will stay working remote. And mm -hmm. there's definitely room for improvement in how we collaborate with each other. People are getting Zoom fatigue. Um, we mm -hmm. believe that we don't need as many meetings. It, yeah. Sometimes you meet a two-minute conversation with a colleague in a hallway, and the hallway is virtual in this case, and you solve yeah. the need, you solve your question, you solve the update. So it's about questioning the way we used to work and helping those teams who, who feel that way, you know, who are on the verge of deciding. Um, you know, our platform basically allows to have continuous video chats, audio chats, obviously text, and share yeah. documents, share screen, um, you name it, right? But instead of keeping each other in a square or in a grid, you literally live in that space. You design mm -hmm. your own office, you design your own spot, and you express yourself by designing it that way. So I don't want to turn this into a, you know, a, a brochure, but yeah, we're excited about what we're seeing. You know, this is our users telling us, hey, I used to feel more lonely, Mm -hmm. And this allows me to feel that I'm not as far because many of our users have one person in one city, you know, mm -hmm. and they have folks to many countries as well. So imagine that you see who's laughing, you yeah. see someone interacting and you can tell, yeah, I think I can just join them and say hi and ask about their weekend. Mm -hmm. and, and to hear from our users, you know what, I actually feel less lonely or you know what, we have less meetings today. So... <laughs> Man, no, no, that's awesome because you're taking it. It's almost like the whole meta thing going on, right? You know, you're you're fully, you're you're almost taking that, like you're taking the human interaction and making it possible virtually, right? And you're scaling out to more than just the. I'm in the Virginia area, DC, Virginia area. I have to go to an office. I only see those people that are in the office. You know, now I can actually talk to people that are in a whole nother state, country, whatever it is, right? Am I am I right with that? <laughs> well, yes, plus plus one hundred, Bobby. And uh, mm -hmm. it's just about expressing and re remembering that we're humans, and the fact that on Monday, if it was your birthday on the weekend, someone can put balloons in your office. Yeah, and and, and we underestimate the value of those things because we we underestimate the value of someone saying, "Hey, high five, and yeah. do something," because I think you were great last week. So it's it's not as, it's not the metaverse that the headlines are popping. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's a space that is as useful as possible, as simple as possible, mm -hmm. and I, I love that. Um, you know, <laughs> no, no, it is no, no, That's awesome, David, because, because you're bringing, like I said, you're just bringing that human interaction in, in into that virtual space. So many people, the problem that you saw all the time during COVID, right, mm -hmm. was that you're missing out on that human interaction, right? Yeah. And then you took it a step further and said, this is what it means to interact from a human standpoint, face to face. I'm in your face, I'm sitting there. I mean, you know, you, you got the ne negative aspects of human, right? Chaotic, can, and humans can be chaotic and stuff. Yeah. But, you know, when you think about it, it's just like you get the positive, you get the negative, you get all that stuff, but it's still beautiful, right? You know, like you said, the balloons, if I get a balloon, I can still get a balloon for my birthday, right? You know, and I'm getting it in that office space. That right there, I would have got it before, right? During COVID, I would have got it, all that good stuff. You know, if I was actually going into the office, it would have been a celebration or you get the office parties, right? Hey, mm -hmm. you know, we got Christmas parties. We got, you know, uh, Thanksgiving feasts, you know, things like that. And we're all collaborating. You know, that's a that's a whole different vibe, you know, that you're bringing there. I, yeah, and this is just the beginning, you know, Bobby, uh, we need to remind ourselves that these are not pixels on a screen, right? But this is someone who may learn that they're more introvert than they thought. And that mm. includes myself and others are more extrovert and others are more visual learners. Others are more audio learners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the more we are aware and humble that we have a lot to learn, I believe we're going to do a better job as, you know, as enabling as an enabling company for this 
and for this trend, right? Yeah. Um, we're only starting, so I don't have all probably all the solutions or all the answers to questions. You'll get there, man. You'll get there, and <laughs> and this is amazing to start, you know, because uh, if everybody checks out, you know, kumospace.com, you know, I checked it out and I was like, man. I need to figure out how to take advantage of this. You know, I almost want to, you know, spread the word across my company now, you know, and be able to say, look, everybody needs to take advantage of this. I own my own company on the side of the company I work with nine to five. That's something to take advantage of right there. You I know, can give you a, a guided tour anytime. Yeah, yeah. It's like a networking god or something, you know, for <laughs> you know. Um, but but yeah, so I mean I had a visualization. I always think we work. Right. When I think about workspaces, right, everybody knows we work. Right. You know, but this brings something different because I sit there and I'm like, man, do I really want to actually leave and drive out to Washington, D.C. to go have the same value that you're bringing here? You know, especially in the workspaces with my own company, you know, it may have its, its benefits to do something like that. But at the same time, you know, it sometimes people don't want to leave the, the the space anymore right you know and it and it scales the way that you're doing because i'm just hitting people in that dmv area you know right there in dc virginia maryland area you know by going to this we work in dc but i could possibly if i mean correct me if i'm wrong i could possibly talk to people that are no longer in the dmv area now i can go talk to somebody on the west coast right you know in california absolutely and imagine if in the past you, if you needed a break from your flow and you wanted mm -hmm. just to catch up with someone in the past, that was mainly just talking. But yeah. what, if, what if I'm more introvert and, and what if connecting with my colleague is as simple as solving the New York Times puzzle, mm -hmm. right? like the crossroad, crosswords? And, and we, we allow that. And that is okay because we, we are all different, right? So yeah. if we allow someone to feel they're connected to someone, without talking about the big party on last Saturday, so to speak, mm -hmm. then I feel we're doing our job, right? Yeah, 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 definitely. So, you know, I thank you for breaking down Kumo Space. Everybody definitely check it out. Being in the area you are, right, head of data, right, focus in that area, right, what does that mean, right, to be head of data? When I think about, like, a chief data officer, mm -hmm. all right, I think that that's the person that oversees this range of data, data related functions, you know, the atmosphere, you know, everything dealing with data. And they may include, it might include like data management, it might include, you know, ensuring the data is governed, right? You know, the quality of the data, creating this whole strategy for data, you know, they may like also be responsible for data analytics and then the business intelligence of it as well. So what does it mean to be head of data, right? What does that daily task look like for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say one way to think of the mandate, the quote that I was given is do anything that needs to be done to make sure mm -hmm. that the best possible use of data at this company happens to achieve its full potential as a company. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to say data, parentheses, engineering, comma, analytics, comma, science. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I am fortunate and part of what I was excited about since joining was I report to, the, to our CEO and my main stakeholders are our head of product, our head of marketing and our head of sales. Right? Mm -hmm. So I'm in the particular interesting and fun um, uh, point in time that it's me. I'm the first day to hire. So I'm taking it from zero to one. Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, this is way before the teams, the larger analytics teams that you hear about on LinkedIn and in, everywhere, right? Where there are already divisions and specializations. At this point in time, there's an increased percentage of time that needs to be allocated in foundation, foundational yeah. aspects, right? Uh, source of truth, data assets, mm. solving, solving for now, but planning for the future, right? right. And right. then, of course, partnering with my stakeholders to think and to find out what's coming ahead for them, right? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, our day to day is never like each other. You know, it fluctuates because we move fast. We're a Series A company, um, yeah. around 27 volts. So it's, it's hard to predict. And you have to basically, it keeps me on my toes. And that's something, one of the things I love about it. Right, right. So, so how do you, um, so as like head of data and you're partnering with those stakeholders, uh, 
I want to elaborate like on what that means, right? You know, because you know, partnering with the stakeholders, it could be like, hey, like you said, a high five, right? Hey guys, how you doing and stuff, right? Or it could be more detailed than that, right? Are you collecting the problems that they're having, right? You know, where data can solve it. Do you see yourself on a daily basis talking to those stakeholders, saying, hey, look, stakeholder A, stakeholder B, stakeholder C, you know, um, what problems are you having? Or are you just listening to them while they're while they're ranting about their problems? And then you're like, they didn't get solved that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's part of it, for sure. Um, it's a great question. I would say that there have been uh, phases, you know, since I joined. I, I joined the company mm -hmm. earlier this year. Yeah. Um, you can imagine once joining, it starts with a, where are we now? You know, what is our status mm -hmm. quo? And then what will be my recommendation for first three months, first six months, first year? So the first several months, I would say there was a faster topic rotation among my stakeholders, right? Mm -hmm. My recommendation was, let's try to achieve some parity, you know, so that our first, our initial changes benefit as many of them as possible to get us to an initial working uh, state, right? So after the first six months, I've been pursuing, instead of breath, more like death. Therefore, I'm spending more time with the same stakeholder going deeper into, to give you an example, what are the biggest questions you're trying to solve? What are the bigger mm -hmm. problems you're trying to fix? So similar to the embedded model that you see in larger organizations, where an analyst practically goes and attends the, uh, the backlog and the rituals and the stand-ups of that team, trying to get as acquainted as possible with their pain points, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. that's what I'm calling like stage two, right? Why? Because if I work with my product, head of product, I don't only want to know what's the question they want to answer in the next two hours. I want to know mm -hmm. what's coming up next week, next month, and potentially next quarter. Right. So right. I, I would start the answer with those two main phases. So that's interesting. You know, do, do, would you say you know, coming from scratch, right? Because a lot of people are now saying, hey, I'm going to hire a head of data, right? They're going to hire this chief data officer. They're going to hire this chief, chief strategist, you know, for data. And they're focusing on the data now. When you come into an organization from the beginning, right? Like you came in, you say you've been there for, for about a year now, you know, um, coming to the organization, is it like I have to hire a certain amount of people first. Right? I got to hire a data scientist. I need to hire a data engineer. You know, I need to hire a data uh, analyst or something like that. Or is it is it a matter of like you you're you're sitting there listening and you're and you're saying, hey, look, I need to clean everything up. You know, because because a lot of times, you know, you you come in if you're coming in to an organization as a chief data officer. I mean, the amount of data you're looking at, I feel like it's like the matrix, right? You know, you, you might it might get crazy and stuff, you know? It's like, where do you even start, right? <laughs> Great question. I, I love to start by sharing that I was fortunate that I joined a company that had a team that with a foresight and existing decision made of saying, uh -huh. we'll hire a data, a data person soon because we believe in the value of someone enabling this partnership model. But mm -hmm. more importantly, because that's just a wish, more importantly is way before we hired that person, we're going to invest in the analytics instrumentation so that we mm -hmm. can start gathering um, usage, performance data, you name it, all the yeah. different domains. So my day one, in fact, uh, on day two, I created my first dashboard showing the usage of some of our beta users. Mm -hmm. um, and that doesn't happen, uh, it takes a village. Right. So even yeah. though I joined and I was able to do that on day two, it was because the team had the foresight to invest in that tracking. Right. And, you know, mm. we can be honest. If we are engineers or uh, uh, software engineers, the tracking is not necessarily the most exciting, right? Part of, uh, <laughs> yeah. of, of building the product. <laughs> However, they, they had that, that vision and it, it changed my first month and my first six months dramatically. Um, so I, I wanted to share that. And then, Second, um, given what I said about, hey, this, this was going from zero to one data hire, 
you pretty much have to do everything um, ah, with yeah. the right priorities. Right? Mm -hmm. So I, I love joking that when I used to be at a larger company, um, I had five analysts in my team and they were like 500 employee company. Mm -hmm. You know, it's natural that we experience that tech debt of our data, of our analytics, our transformations, our, um, you know, our IT logic. So we talk a lot about tech debt and we need to fix this and that. But now the coin is flipped and being the first data hire, I'm creating the tech debt. <laughs> <laughs> you are. You are. <laughs> so it's, it's a fascinating waltz, so to speak, between I want to build robust and clean data assets so that we reduce the pain in the future. But it's more important to solve the question and the problem now and just, you know, we have to move and iterate and keep going because that's the right. world we're living, right? We're an early stage company. We have to move fast. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You definitely have to have to move fast, right? <laughs> you have to be on top of it because if you don't, you'll miss something, an opportunity, you'll slip up, you'll fall back, you know, all those different things can happen. You know, like how, how do you see yourself being head of data? How do you even hire the right people? You know, when I look at it, like, you know, I don't, sometimes, you know, you try to decipher what, you know, you, you might say, we need a data engineer. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, what does that mean? You know, okay, we need somebody to, to do this and that, you know, and I guess it probably, do, do, it probably is different based off of the organization, whether they are uh, small, medium, large, or even the type of things they're working on. Because, you know, when I look at like, trying to hire somebody right if i'm chief of data which i don't know if i ever become chief of data right i would love to do something like that that'd be great you know but but if i'm ever in that role that you are in and i have to sit there and say man i gotta build a team i have to build a team of of, of data scientists or whatever it is how do i how do you decipher like who's the first person to hire right or who's the right person to hire what's your thoughts on that it's a very, I hate the use of, overuse of jargon, but it has to be holistic. There is, I did it, I did it. And <laughs> the, the, the detail be, be beneath that is data engineering frequently or most frequently is connected with how complex your data sources are mm -hmm. and how complex is the, potentially the industry, the businesses. Um, many SaaS products, which are mainly software, if they happen to be in non-regulated industries, if they happen to have fewer data sources, the data engineering need may mm -hmm. be solved by some capacity of a, of a software engineer. And that is fine. Um, when that happens, the data team, whatever shape it has, then will typically shoulder more of the effort in you know, cleaning it, normalizing it, and maintaining pipelines. And that is completely fine. Mm -hmm. where, where I have seen inflections, is obviously uh, with the company size, right? When you have larger departments or, or larger specialized departments where SLAs are needed, you know, you mm -hmm. need to ensure uh, quality, availability, reliability, observability, observability. and mm -hmm. that 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 is a job by itself, right? Um, <laughs> I've also been in, in industries where even just regulatory or compliance matters increases the layers that are needed. And if mm -hmm. you ask a, a data analyst to do that in addition to finding insight, you will, you will pay for it. I mean, it will reduce the available capacity, right? Um, then I think to answer the other part, which is when a data analyst or a data science, my preference is not to be overly um, <laughs> obsessed with our titles and think about the needs, right? Mm. At the end of the day, um, they're all tools. Right, they're all either statistical methods or, or models or data. Remember, you can build incredibly impactful findings with a spreadsheet, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, in my opinion, the most valuable part is seeing how mature the stakeholders are. Mm -hmm. Will it be how much of a push versus pull it will be? Yeah. Are, are the stakeholders uh, a little bit down the road? They're domain experts, they know already what they do not know. Or do you think we need to do more research, pure research where we do not know what we should be not doing, right? So I think it's, it's that matrix that tells you, okay, 
you may be able to to run faster at the start, or, mm -hmm. or you may be able to buffer for some uncertainty. And that's normal, by the way. There's no indication that it was wrong. It's simply mm -hmm. the state of things. No, I like that answer. And uh, I'm sure the audience will like the answer as well. I mean, because you're really talking about the process, right? You know, of, of getting to that, that end goal, you know? And I, I think that a lot of people don't understand the process is very important. You know, no matter the position you're in, it's probably the same methodology that you're speaking on, you know? And uh, the stakeholders is something that I saw, that I heard from you that is very key, right? You know, it seems like the stakeholders are key to being able to make that final decision because, or, or at least maybe not making the final decision, but making a decision that actually adheres to what is needed in the company or the environment. You it know? will in inform it. I, I think I would say that like in it informs the, the ultimate decision. And just as yeah. importantly, it tells you, should the team have a higher percentage of senior data folks or as analysts? Or do you need more capacity and perhaps someone uh, earlier in their career can cover the needs? No, that's an excellent point. I like that informs the decision, right? You know, and then it probably supports it along the way, right? <laughs> At the end yes. of the day, you know, you make that decision and, you know, you have the facts to support it, right? You know, um, so I want to I want to dive into this topic that I think is very exciting for me. Um, especially the importance of diversity and inclusivity, you know, inclusiveness in, in the data field, right? And how that relates to algorithms as well, right? And, we, and, and we're not even getting technical, but if you think about it, in my eyes, right, when I think about, I, I just did a webcast with somebody in the government and they had me on their, their podcast, a webcast, and it was a webcast and they had me on there and their first thing was, how can this product, right? I was representing NetApp, uh, my company at the time. They said, how does this product actually help the, 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 um, how does this product actually help with bias free algorithms, right? Mm -hmm. That's what they said. And I was like, man, you know, I couldn't answer that question, right? I had to, I had to change it around because I realized that you know, I, I've always known this, but the question finally came out and it, it made me really be able to speak about it uh, from my studies in the past, just thinking, man, it's not the algorithm is biased, in my opinion, right? It's the data that is presented to the algorithm, right? You know, Andrew Ng, you know, this, this, this famous develop, uh, uh, data scientist, right, who teaches Stanford and all that, he talked about it. He said, man, you know, so many people focus on making their model more accurate, right? Their machine learning model is so accurate and stuff, you know. But at the end of the day, right, they don't focus on making the data that's presented to that model more clean, right, right throughout the process. And so then that took me a step further, right? And it said, man, you know, not only is the data bias, right, it's not the algorithm, but in my opinion, there needs to be a more diverse representation of people that are focused on inputting that data, right? Because mm -hmm. one uh, ethnicity cannot speak for everybody when they're inputting that data, you know? So I wanna ask you, what, what's your thoughts on the importance of diversity and inclusion when it comes down to being involved with algorithms and, and all this biased data stuff that I just talked about? Yes, I, I think it's definitely everyone's job. It's everyone's job to keep investing effort and even thought into mm -hmm. finding solutions for these. I, I have been um, generally um, encouraged or optimistic when I hear a broader awareness of the need to improve this problem. So mm -hmm. that, that you have me, great. I am okay when I hear folks saying, oh, so the solution to that bias is make sure that data is more diverse. And to your point, uh, that the training sets include more options, more, more minorities or more yeah. perspectives, which is technically 
a, a probable solution, right? Like, yes, we, we have heard the horror stories of those detection mechanisms or cameras that, that simply miss out <laughs> right. faults. So, yeah, if you apply that um, prescription, which is someone will decide, A, the data set that we used to send, now turn it 70% and the remaining 30% include more diversity so the models do the right job. But there's another problem. What happens when the next sectionality or the next source of lack of diversity is identified? And then all those data sets need to be updated because mm -hmm. the team that was very forward thinking to include that minority data set couldn't think of the next section or sectional angle. Mm. So don't get me wrong. It is much better than the status quo. But in my opinion, if we want solutions, it's three words, bring them in. And that ah. means that the diversity starts at the team who thinks and who plans for those data sets and for everything. We don't need to enumerate the parts of the code of the model that need to be guard railed. Mm -hmm. if we start with diversity. So I'm, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry if it sounds an oversimplification, but if we instead, instead of guard railing the data, put the effort into the recruiting part and bringing them in, I feel it would be much more protected. The model will simply be updated um, with the experiences of that team. Am, am I making sense? No, you're making a lot of sense. And, and it's, it's crazy because you just gave me a vision, right? I can imagine, just like I was talking about customer, customers are now, like individuals, you, myself, you know, we're just Joe Smo just out here just relaxing, right? We're doing our own research now, right? We're making our own data-driven decisions, right? Because even though we're getting, we're, we're basically collecting data from multiple resources to be able to make a decision. Right. And I can I could the vision I had was that, you know, after somebody has created this data set, right, this diverse data set. Right. You know, it's still people are going to continue to, like, do their own research and stuff. You know, mm -hmm. and I was like, wow, I didn't think about that. Right. Because you're you're forward thinking you're thinking, man, you know, after this is created, even in the diverse market, you know, this data set is still going to be another level to that, you know, after that, you know. Yeah. If, for example, if, if ethnicity is the easiest because, you know, we can perhaps observe it, but what's next? A, a, a writing style? What's next? A, mm -hmm. um, you know, we know um, the issue with vis visual acuity or, or lack of, you know, certain different abilities. Yeah. There, there are going to be more angles. So predicting them... <laughs> Uh -huh. maybe impossible. We'll always be failing eventually. <laughs> so what if you start by enriching the team to begin with, with as much as possible? And I be, I'm not an expert, evidently, and I'm sure there's a lot of conversations and efforts. Uh, there's excuses, for sure, you know, to, to that. When, when we say bring them in, people say many excuses and availability. Um, I, for one, I'm very optimistic of um, initiatives like some larger companies are pursuing apprenticeships, are, mm -hmm. you know, to, to build um, broader uh, talent pipelines. And mm -hmm. I, I think that is a beautiful effort. I would say more companies should be doing that, especially the larger ones, because they have more um, elbow room, or so to speak, you know, mm -hmm. more, more, more maneuvering space. So I believe that if those efforts multiply and continue, then the effort to, quote, bring them in will be more successful. No, I absolutely agree, man. You know, I, I think if, if people want to be successful in their career, you know, no matter your position, right, but if you're in an organization itself, they have to start with that. There's this thing they're talking about now. It's been going on for a while, like data mesh, right? you know, the data mesh, data fabric, right? And they think about, you know, where the source of the data is coming from. It's that domain expert, right? You know, yeah. every, pre, right. prior to this recording, we talked about how you're in the finance industry and you're a data scientist. And and that right there, 
to me, if you're a data scientist and a finance engineer, you have to know about some of the lingo that's there. So you have to be able to, uh, that, that is a unique aspect, right? That, 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 that somebody cannot do. If I'm in the healthcare industry and I'm a data scientist, I dare dare to like go over to the finance industry because I don't know crap about over the finance industry, right? Because that's not my domain, you know? And so, you know, there's people out here that can do the jack of all trades, master none thing. But I think to be a valuable data scientist, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, like being in your domain, a data analyst, being in your domain that you know, right? I love sports. I love football, specifically American football. I love that specifically. And I sit there and I'm like, man, that right there, I know everything about it, right? I know all the I know what yak means, right? Yards after catch. I know what these specific things mean, right? You know, yeah. and and so when I'm sitting there feeding them the data, if I was at the beginning of the process of feeding them that data, then I know that I can clean it because this looks white, uh, like like weird, or or you need the white spaces cleaned out here or something like that, right? If I'm in the finance industry. I have to know some stuff. I don't even know what I would would have to know in the finance industry, right? You know, I would have to relearn everything about that to be like a solid data scientist in that industry. Do you, do you see that that being a, a you know, I, I guess we can call that diversity, you know, not necessarily diversity, but it's more like uh, understanding that you have your roles. Does that, does that play any part in the diversity, diversity realm as well? I, I think it definitely does. Um... I have a slight counter to that, just for devil's advocate. Um, I am I agree wholeheartedly that folks who pursue some domains are naturally um, having or naturally have an advantage, right? A tremendous advantage. Any domain. I I also believe the counter could be not having the bias of years in a certain industry also keeps you unbiased, <laughs> sorry for the mm. and, and unbiased to explore things that maybe someone with too much schooling would not pursue. So yeah. I'm a big fan of <laughs> serendipity. I, it happens, you know, companies fall and thrive sometimes for serendipity. So imagine if, if I have, I come from finance and I know that something is like a don't, maybe I, I have a blind spot and I would not pursue something because my finance colleagues would think I'm dumb. But perhaps yeah. an analyst without that exposure could still try it and maybe find something. Mm -hmm. So um, I, back to your point about the diversity, I believe that when you're building a team, not everybody should be copy-paste of, of each other, right? Um, um, I have right. seen incredible teams where if one fella is an absolutely stat maverick and fan and other folks are more on the technical side, right? They love mm -hmm. more about the data and wrangling and the newest and other folks are more about the storytelling. Natural. I'm not saying 100%. I'm just saying you have some leanings, right? Mm -hmm. But when you put those folks in the same team, magic happens. Uh, magic happens because then first they learn from each other. Um, they know better what their gaps are. And they become humble, humble to say, hey, fella, I would love to learn that one day. Can you help me out? And, and so as a manager or as a team leader or builder, you have to keep an eye on that so that you encourage that, that cross-pollination as much as possible, right? And then the stakeholder just benefit because a stakeholder will rarely be happy with only a, a stats guru, mm -hmm. right? A stakeholder will, in this example, sometimes need to help, need help selling something to their, you know, executive sponsors. So when, yeah. you, when you allow this... Um, kitchen to have these different specialized cooks, um, you can build pretty incredible impact, which at the end of the day is the goal. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it, that, you're right. That, that is the goal. And I, I'm, I, I'm excited that you were able to kind of broaden our, our, our view of that, right? Because when you think about, like you said, that diverse team, right, that's important. Right. And I'm thinking diverse when I think data science, OK, data science, you need data engineer, you need, you know, uh, data analyst. But it's more diverse than that. Right. You know, yeah. and 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 that right there kind of just it changes the mindset. Right. And I think that's the visionary or the vision vision mindset that you need right. as a, a CDO or right? a chief data officer or 
you know, at a strategy level, you need to be able to understand those type of things because yeah. at the level that I'm at, I'm more of that, okay, I'm the data scientist. I have a partner over here that's a data engineer. I have another partner over here that's a data analyst. And, you know, you got all these different data, data, data uh, roles. And that's the thing I'm thinking about when it comes down to diversity, right? You know, but it's way more than that, right? You know, and so I, I appreciate that, that aspect. So, David, I don't want to hold you. At the end of the podcast, I usually end with what I call a dope nugget, dope summary. I appreciate you being on the podcast. Oh, now, when we, when we talk about what I've learned right today, I've learned that the stakeholders inform the decision, right? You know, I, I like that what you said, because it's important to understand how much of a role that stakeholder plays. You know, if you're at that CDO level, you're at the head of data level, you are understanding more than just the technical aspect. You got to think business and you have to think what drives the business, you know, from a data standpoint. You know, when you're sitting there presenting those visualizations or those charts and things like that, you know, there's a reason why you have the stuff. I mean, I don't know if you do it, but I know some people may do bias ways of <laughs> trying to transition to that, you know, to make to, to shift people one way or the other. But, you know, the data never lies. Right. You know, unless as long as it's like like quality data that's coming in. And so you sit there and the stakeholders that are informing you of all these different things that that they need in the environment, they're actually telling you the problems that are there, right? You know, without saying, hey, this is the problem I have. Some are more direct, but majority of the time they're 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 if you just listen to the stakeholders, you probably would come up with a thousand problems that you need to solve with data. You know, you don't have to you don't even have to have a data talk, right? You know, so that's what I've learned, you know. David, is there anything that you want to share with the audience of uh, what you learn at the end of the day? I think you beat me to in terms of the dope nugget. Uh, you, you did an incredible recap. Uh, I would add one of my favorite memories of, of seeing how this interaction with stakeholders changed our game. Um, sometimes stakeholders, li listen, we're in startups, right? We move fast. We don't have all the information, blah, blah, blah. You know. It. Um, but this includes senior stakeholders, and they're doing their best and there's incredible competition for their time. So they're not going to give you a day to talk about their dreams. Right. And, and there was a, a case where a, a senior stakeholder just joined the company. They were doing their, their best, but they hadn't till that date. Um, being able to sit down and state their, their roadmap needs. So I, I, I was coaching my analyst to very gently force them to sit down enumerate, prioritize, sell it to us. Like, tell me why you want me to work on this and what's going to be the, the, the impact to the business. Again, I say force, which it was a force, but it was a very coaching. So there you go. You had a junior analyst, very friendly, coercing a senior stakeholder mm -hmm. to gather their team and prioritize. And it was incredibly successful because yeah. they, they realized that it was worth the effort. Uh -huh. and, and that little spreadsheet with priorities was guiding the effort of my analyst and my team for the quarter. And they could see the progress, right? They could see what's yeah. happening, what's blocked, what's moving. So, sorry if I hijacked the nugget, but oh. th there's so much value. And it goes both ways, right? They don't, stakeholders don't tell us 100%. We help them. And sometimes we have to tell them, help me help you. And, and that's how the walls go, so... Oh, oh, so no, no, that's important to understand that you can guide them in a direction. Yeah. You know, I didn't, I've never thought about it like that, right? You know, because the stakeholders have their opinion, they can be completely wrong or they could be given their biased opinion, whatever it is, right? You know, and then you coming in, you have to be this unbiased person, right? 100%. You know? And I didn't think about that. You have to be an unbiased person, you have to have the conversation with them. And you hear it's almost like government and contracting, right? You know, contractors are going to sit there and you get you get a million different opinions from contractors. And they're like, look, mm -hmm. this is how I should go because I believe this. This is the way I've done it for hundreds of years, whatever it is. You get another one that says, I believe that, you know, but at the end of the day, that government person has to make the better decision, 
and then they, they take all these different opinions. I see, I see what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, decision, you know, and so ultimately, when you're talking to these different stakeholders, it's uh, you're coming in with an unbiased point of view. I like it. You know, I, I just like what you said. You know, I love it. <laughs> and you come with an unbiased point of view, and you're and you're you're end up, you know, taking those different, I guess, nuggets for lack of better words, and you're, and you're hearing what they're saying, right? You know, and then you ultimately make the decision or the way that you should go or you can actually guide them because mm-hmm. I mean, i'm mean, i sure it's a lot of time they don't even know right they don't know what the problem is right they don't know right. why they're like why are you even here as a data science <laughs> uh, it's it's not a joke yes <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you probably hear that you probably th- they probably think that all the time they're like why what what is David doing here? You know, this is pretty, why is he here? You know, but uh, you know, you I'm sure you present the value to them along the way. You know, ultimately you're able to show them the vision. You know, because and you're able to guide them in the right direction. So I appreciate you being on the podcast. I love everything that you said. The audience is going to go crazy over this. They're going to love it. You know, because we're talking about at a certain level, right? You know, I've talked to some CEOs. I've never talked to a head of data. Right. You know, of a company. And so being that they're like, man, I could be this role. You know, you're giving them hope and, and passion about that, you know, to be able to make a transition from something that has, uh, you know, I would say enough to do about data. Right. But a lot of roles have enough to do about data. But you made that transition to to actually head of data at a company. Right. You know, you're not even talking about finance anymore. But you probably could help the finance side if you need yes. to, right? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. No, thank you, thank you so much, Roy, for having us, having me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So I want to play a game, quick game, right? You know, the audience knows I like to play this game called Overrated, Underrated. All right, I got it from a motivational speaker I know called Gary V. His name is Gary V. And you know, great person. You know, a little bit blunt. You know, probably more blunt than a lot of people like. But you know, he he had a game, right? Called Overrated, Underrated. And I wanted to bring that to the technology industry. The reason why I wanted this game to occur in the technology industry is because a lot of times our audience and just people in, in general just look at us as just geeking it out all the time. All we do is just think about technology, you know, blah, blah. And I, I would admit, you know, sometimes I just over I just talk to my wife all the time, my kids about data. I'm always thinking about data all the time. Like it's just gets out of control. Even in my mind, I'm telling myself to shut up, right? You know, but, uh, but, 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 you know, we're so technical. We think about it a lot, even in your position. I know you think about it a lot, but we do have opinions, right? We do have opinions about, you know, I don't know, the, uh, uh, about cheese, right? We have opinions <laughs> about the Super Bowl. Absolutely. You know? Oh, yeah. We have our opinions, <laughs> right, about these things. And, and so, you know, we want to, I want the audience to know that we're normal, you know, <laughs> that we, we're not just all geeky all the time. But we do <laughs> think about some of the normal stuff that they think about as well. And we have an opinions about it. So I'll ask you a question. You get to say whether you think it's overrated, underrated, or right where it needs to be. And you get to elaborate on it if you want to, whatever it is. Ready to go? All right. Let's do it. All right. The television. Ooh. Um. I would say as a as an appliance as a device, I would say under uh, overrated. No worries, um, no I would say, however, the interesting uh, follow up to that would be what do you use the television for? Um, oh, oh, I, yeah. I, I think, oh. Uh, I think <laughs> you know, listen. I think uh, as a device, uh, you can use it for so many amazing ways. I think mm-hmm. if you only use it to what to binge on some shows, you're missing out. Yeah. Um, I, so, I, assuming the shows that folks you, you watch it or use the TV to um, to watch is broad, then I think yeah. that's okay. <laughs> it's so addicting, though, man. Some exactly. of them shows, man. It's like it's like social media, right? You know, I don't even. I honestly don't like social media, but for some reason, every time I click on it, I start. I get lost in it, right? It's like to make you're not the only one. You're not the only one. So don't don't, yeah. don't feel bad. And then I get mad at myself because I'm like, oh, I'm taking away from my business. I should be focusing on that, you know, and everything. So, you know, I agree with the television thing. I didn't think about how you can use it for other things. And it could still be either overrated or underrated, honestly. You know, if you use it for YouTube to study, 
you know, different technologies as you're doing. You can, that might be different. you can browse the internet, you know, the Wikipedia rabbit holes, which I've uh-huh. been a victim to. Sometimes you just want to sit on the couch and a nice big screen instead of yeah. doing your work chair, right? So just the yeah. same. All right, all right, all right. Uh, the printer. Overrated. Um, oh, I agree, man. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's funny. Growing up, I when laser printers came out, I was just all over it. I was a big nerd of lasers. I, I spoke about lasers in science first. So to think that a laser was printing of this very crisp sheet of paper, you know, black ink, <laughs> I love it. But I think we grow up and we need to be um, responsible for our impact, right, on the on the planet. And printing has its its share. So I think it's, yeah, yeah, it's time yeah. to to put it away. Yeah, we got to put it away, man. I'm I'm actually tired of it. I actually talked to somebody the other day, and I was like, man, as technical as I am, for some reason, printer always gives me a headache. You know. <laughs> Like I'm sitting there, I'm like, man, what button? The buttons is about a hundred buttons, you know, and like especially the big printers in an organization. You're like, why Ooh, is yeah. there so many buttons, man? Wait, you know? <laughs> are you saying perhaps printers will be the next source of shame as VCRs? You know, as adults <laughs> that you were too embarrassed to admit that you just get to make it work. Yeah, it, it could be exactly, <laughs> exactly, man. <laughs> All right, so next one, the Golden Great Bridge. Oh, rightly rated. Uh, it's, rightly it's rated? a masterpiece. You know, I, I, I'm in San Francisco. I went uh, running it, running oh, through it for the first like time. Like a marathon? Or no, something? no, no. Just on my on a birthday, um, like mm-hmm. last year, I ran for the first time because normally I go biking. Mm-hmm. And it's breathtaking. It's actually much better to, to run or walk through it than bike because if you bike, it goes too fast. Um, so sometimes I think people take too many pictures of it. But it's just wonderful to to be there. That's that's yeah. what I'm saying. Be there, it's incredible. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, I've I've been there for like the VMware conference, like two three years in a row or something. When it was in San Francisco, and we would have we had to actually like run. It was like a jog, you know, through the Golden. I mean, it was beautiful. Nice. You know, I nice. actually, you know, I I. I think it was beautiful. I've never experienced it any other way, right? We didn't drive through it or anything like that. It was just run, walk and running through it. Yeah. You know? So it was amazing to me. Uh, all right. We just talked about this, but social media. Overrated. Um, <laughs> I, yeah. I think it, uh, well, we all know what happens with it. Um, I think we, we're reaching the time that after knowing what it can do in a good way and in a bad way, we are mm-hmm. now more mature about making changes to it. I'm sure you know you folks with children, you know, you know, you want to mm-hmm. make sure it's used the right way. And I think what's happening in the last year or so, um, it's easy to forget their humans on the other side. And that's my main yeah. concern. <laughs> that's my main concern. So I mean, listen, we all love tech, we love it, um, yeah. but we need to remember. It's humans, right? Um, mm-hmm. We need to take care of each other. So, so yeah, we gotta, yeah, it can get crazy, man. I agree, yeah. and 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 uh, you know, I don't like the fake stuff, right? Like you can actually fake it out. You can fake that you're having a success through social media, right? But you that can has a next to a car, yeah. right? You know, and say, oh man, you know, I'm I'm sitting here doing this and that, you know. And then it's really not your car, right? You know, <laughs> and, and even though you know it's, you know, you know what you know, but it that perception impacts other people mm-hmm. who, do, who do not know that it's not real. And right. that's and you know what happens to teenagers and you know uh, all that. Yeah. Uh, it's just painful to to watch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, last two Alcatraz. I don't know if you've been there or not. Uh, yes, I have. You did. Um, okay, okay. I haven't. I didn't get a chance to go there, but I'll let I'll let you talk. Okay, I'll give you. I'll give you a tip. So, <laughs> it's highly rated. I, mm-hmm. I wouldn't make a long line because, in general, I don't like ma- uh, making cues for a long time. Just yeah. get it in advance, and I'll give you a tip. I hear or I heard that you can actually get tickets to go at night. So you get the mm-hmm. tours and you get the learn the history and the spooky version oh. of the tour at night. So yeah. that I believe is worth just get it in advance as much as possible. I mean, because the tickets sell out. Um, but it's it's really nice. 
the more you read about the history of it and also the sad history mm -hmm. of yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm okay saying it's uh, rightly rated. Okay, okay, okay. All right, oh, well, two more. All, All right. right. All right. Ice cream. Oof, that hits close. Um, I, think, <laughs> I think it's underrated for me. I mean, uh -huh. because I think I love it. It's at the top of my list. I know. Um, it's something about it, man. This is just so crazy. <laughs> but again, everybody loves it. So I think it should be in the rightly rated. Um, uh -huh. You know, I um, my world improved when I found the the low sugar options that actually taste uh -huh, good. Yeah. So to me, it was a game changer because I'm keeping an eye on, on sugar and all that stuff. So, so yes, mm -hmm. I love trying them. <laughs> yeah, I love ice cream, man. It's amazing, you know. But yeah, I've tried the no sugar option. They're still pretty good, you know. Yeah, and it's it's not really. Sometimes you start to not really re realize the difference, you know. So I like it, you know. All right, last thing, the World Cup. Ooh, I think I'm gonna get in trouble for this one um, <laughs> because you know it's almost a um, a national expectation, right? That uh, as a Mexican, mm -hmm. we have to be crazy about it. Um, I'm not, I'm not your guy on that one, unfortunately. So I really would stay overrated. Oh, what man. can I say? Hey, we were talking about diversity, right? So I think yeah, that's okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was a good one, man. Okay, sure here's, here's like... where. Sorry to interrupt you. Here's no, where no, I would say good. when I see those guys, like um, the players, and and when I see them like win and succeed, I just think of them, right? And and I hate when you know sometimes government um, politicians like to wear mm -hmm. their success as if it were them. And I say no, no, no. Like I want them to feel the the way they feel because they deserve it. So mm -hmm. I, I see it as an achievement matter. I say human and team achievement mm -hmm. but uh, everything else i i wanted to stay home <laughs> okay you know i can i can definitely see that man you know and i don't really understand the politics behind it as much you know i mean again i'm i i, I do focus a lot more on like nfl right national football league or yeah. something like that you know so i don't really see the aspects you know and the, the deeper i get into um but there's politics everywhere right there's politics in the nfl for sure you know yeah. and and i i do understand that there's, there's a great possibility 90 percent or more chance that there's politics in any sport that's out there right you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> behind the scenes you know feeding stuff and then controlling the game and things like that you know mm -hmm. and you're like man you just wanted to be a fun experience for you to be able to watch you know and the players are being like they're like pawns now. Yeah. You know, they're like <laughs> it's a, I'm sure there's more. And and I'm not even knowledgeable, but I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure there's more, man. You know, but look, David, I appreciate you being on the podcast, man. This has been exciting. It's been very fun, you know. Audience, thank you for for listening to today. This is my side podcast, the show that makes data your passion. I am your host again, Dapper Data. Where can they reach you at, David? And is there anything that you want to promote right now? Uh, no, thank you so much for having me. This was an awesome chat. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, David Sepulveda, and um, on Twitter, you know, David BLVD. Um, mm -hmm. I love hearing folks how they're enjoying or thriving in the remote work economy, the future work, uh, or just kvetching together. Um, happy to hear from folks in that regard. All right. No, no, thank you. Thank you, David, man. You know, and that, that remote work experience, especially during since COVID, right, it's companies are realizing that you, that they, what they demanded at one point, I've, I've heard this so many times, right, that the demand was there, you had to be there Monday through Friday, right, you know, eight hours plus a, a, a week, right, it's almost like they condition, I mean, eight, eight hours plus a day, and it's almost like they condition the minds to say, you have to do this, right, nobody ever questioned it. Exactly. But then when COVID came, <laughs> then, yeah, um, then and, and people had to work from home, you know, only only because, you know, the business now says, hey, look, this is a liability. Probably if you do come into space, then we'll lose people and things like that. Or it was a force from the government, whatever it was. Now people are starting to say, hold up. Why are we why are we coming back in the office so often? <laughs> <You know? laughs> it can be said as the strongest data point we needed right we could ask yeah. for there you go evidence boom it's yeah done. there's nothing to debate anymore right 
So <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. You know, so but again, thank you for being on the podcast. You know, audience, as you know, you can always reach me at Mr. Dapper Data. That's at percent uh M R D A P P E R D A T A on any one of the social media platforms, your Twitter, your LinkedIn, your Instagram, right? Facebook. And uh, and also you can check out the YouTube video. Please subscribe. It is www.youtube.com forward slash Dapper Data. Uh, definitely check me out and, and my book out and check out my website at www.mrdapperdata.com. Until next time, you all, peace, love. Talk to you later. Thanks, David. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>